let's go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much if you're joining us and tuning in today. Welcome to the third episode of Grit and Glamour right here on YouTube Live with me, your host, Ruby Veridano. These are conversations, honest conversations that show the grind toward the glow up that you don't see on the gram. And on today's episode, I'm super excited to welcome somebody on the other side of the world, Singaporean nutritionist, television host, um, presenter. She does it all, but she's like the most charming person that I've come across this year. Her name is Charlotte May. So Charlotte, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us what it's like in Singapore right now. Hi, Ruby. Um, well, unlike your situation in France, we are sweating here in Singapore. It's warm. Uh, we don't get the beautiful weather that you're having in Paris right now. But um, in terms of the current situation that we're facing globally, in Singapore, we're pretty, I would say, stable at the moment. Um, we still have high numbers. But I don't know if you've been following the news in Singapore, in Singapore, but our situation is kind of unique because we actually exploded it. We actually exploded in the news because a bunch of our uh, migrant workers who are living in dormitories contracted mm -hmm. the, 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 the virus. And then that's when it exploded and it went crazy because they live in very tight dormitories. And it just sparked a huge conversation because people started learning about their living conditions. Um, anyway, I won't get into too much detail, but uh, unfortunately those are where the numbers are really uh, growing, but cases in community, i.e. you know, anything outside the dormitories have been pretty okay. So I'm very thankful for that. Very thankful for, you know, how the government has been handling things. Um, a lot of room for improvement, of course, as with any country in the world, but very thankful to be here. Yeah, and I hope that this awareness will somehow create um, some new changes and some, you know, new priorities for the government to be able to help provide, um, you know, this community with different types of more comfortable living situations, because clearly their well-being affects the well-being of everybody. Yep, you bet. Exactly. But, you know, it's kind of beautiful now because, I mean, it sucks that it takes this um, for, for for these guys to actually uh, be seen in, in light and in a, in, in a different way, but they are now being put up in the hospitals that they have built. They are now being put up mm -hmm. in the hospitals, which are serving as quarantine facilities, the, hospital, the, the hotels that they have built themselves. So it's yeah. nice to know that they are finally kind of like, you know, yeah. living comfortably. So to speak. Yeah. And I want to touch on that later. I think that Singapore has a very unique population and a very different type of um, societal dynamic that I think, um, you know, is, is quite unique uh, because in a lot of Asian countries, the, the population is quite homogenous. Um, with, with the exception for maybe a small foreign population, but Singapore is that kind of international hub. So I'd love to, you know, later on in the conversation, I definitely love to talk to you more about what um, the society, Singaporean society is like, because we obviously had, um, I mean, Singapore has a very different PR now um, with a very famous movie that came out about your, your country. So we'll talk about that later. But right yeah. now, everyone is stuck at home, just like you and I, but the internet allows us to travel. So today I'm like teleporting to Singapore. And the most famous thing about Singapore is the food. So if you are, if when we do get to travel and get to come to Singapore and because you are, your, your domain is food, what are the three things that we should eat first when we get to Singapore? I know there's a lot. Only three? I know, but like, <laughs> let's say we had like 24 hours in Singapore. Like what would we eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Okay. One thing for sure is laksa. I don't know if you've heard of it, but like, I don't even know how, like there's no other dish in the world at least that I know of that replicates this flavor. It's spicy, it's, you know, there's coconut milk in there, there's seafood in there. It's basically a spicy noodle dish in a coconut broth and it mm -hmm. is delicious. Um, so laksa is one of them. Uh, another one would be roti prata. Okay, so, I mean, I have to, before even speaking of all these dishes because our listeners may, you know, start thinking, well, what is Singaporean food after all? We are, uh, like a pot of different cultures mixed together. We've got Chinese, Indian, and Malay populations, major like those are the three main uh, racial groups here in Singapore. 
So laksa would fall under Chinese food. Roti prata would fall under Indian food. It's basically like an Indian flatbread, uh, cooked in ghee, served with all different types of curries. My absolute favorite. Some people eat eat the roti prata, the the flatbread, simply with sugar. Some people like it with marmite. To eat your own. Marmite. Um, that's the second one. Yeah. <laughs> And the third one is a dessert dish. It's called chendol. So that is a Malay dish. Again, it's, oh, you know what? It's similar to halo halo. We're going to talk about why so, Charlotte is actually honorary Filipina, but that'll be for later. <laughs> yeah, but so chendol, again, uh, it's in coconut milk. It's got different ingredients like kidney beans, like these little long jelly strips. Um, absolutely delicious. And gula malaka, which is uh, coconut sugar. Yum, yum, yeah. I mean, just hearing all of that just makes me crave. I mean, I love Asian food. So wherever I am in the world, I'm going to crave Asian food. And I loved eating it in Singapore. Well, we're going to, um, we are going to play a, a little short game really quickly because not only are you Singaporean, but you're also French. And as I understand, you've studied in Paris before. So we're just going to, I'm just going to hold up a couple of words. And you know, you you get a point if you translate it correctly. We're gonna go very easy. I studied, I studied in Paris for five months. Okay, it doesn't even <laughs> count. But sure, let's do this anyway. All right, here we go. Hopefully, your dad um, will be proud of you after this. <laughs> All right, can you see this? Plate, assiette, une assiette. Eggs, dessert. Anneuf, des oeufs. Eggplant, aubergine. Chickpeas, pois chiche. Look at you! Damn, you mm -hmm. got me. <laughs> okay, this one's going to be a tricky. Um, hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's essentially the same word, but you just have to say it with the accent. Okay, um, this is going to be three words. Glass, uh, le, ah, le verre, le verre, verre? <laughs> yeah. Also no, really. La verre, verre. No, mm -hmm. la verre, verte. Mm -hmm. See how tricky oh, French people oh, are? Oh. Mm -hmm. Very tricky. Yeah. Now the next one. Um, baguette. See, baguette. French is so tricky. You have the ver le verre, verre, and then you have chopsticks, which is baguette, which is the same thing as the famous French bread. It's very, very tricky out here. You could see how this could be very confusing. Now. Crazy. Mushroom, ah, um, the champignon. Super Hulk. <laughs> it's okay. just, yeah, voila. It's just super Hulk. <laughs> super Hulk. And then the last one is just, you know, I want to know what your favorite French pastry is, if you have one. Gosh, too many. Um, brioche, hands down. Brioche. Okay, thank yeah. you. Well, um, brioche is like a bread. Um, okay, I'll just go for pain au chocolat. Pain au chocolat, very, very classic. Well, thank you for playing my little game. That was well done. Bravo, bravo. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but they were also all, you know, um, sets us up for not only your uh, two heritage, but also your topic of, you know, your expertise, which is food. Um, so there's been a lot of interesting conversations around the food world, especially women in the food industry, and interestingly, Asian women in the food industry, at least in my part of the world. I come from the United States. I live in Paris now, but I still very much am plugged into a lot of these conversations. So as you might know, Alison Roman, who is a uh, famous uh, millennial chef, um, took some jabs at two Asian women entrepreneurs, um, Chrissy Teigen and Marie Kondo. And I guess I was just curious to know kind of what your thoughts are on that, because also I know that this is a very American context. So for, yeah. you know, and we're living in a very global world right now. So I'm just curious to know, as a woman in food in Southeast Asia, do you come across, you know, what, what are your thoughts on this conversation? And um, is this kind of issue something that you think about there? It's really interesting you bring this up because honestly, uh, it didn't blow up here in Singapore. 
And I only found out about what had happened because of two Insta stories. And then of course, articles on the internet following that. One was, I, I can't remember her name now, but you know, an Instagram account of this lady who lives in America. And she said something about, oh, I'm really sick and tired of, you know, women beating each other, well, you know, bringing each other down. Uh, and then I was kind of like, okay, I don't know, maybe something happened in her personal life. And then you started to talk about it as well. And then I thought to myself, wait, like I need to read up about this. And uh, it, it's really unfortunate what had happened. I'm really glad Allison apologized. I don't really know what exactly happened after that, but um, it's sad, you know, it, like we're living in 2020 in a time where, you know, bringing someone down, especially if you are someone of privilege and you bring someone down um, when you're meant to be on the same team. I mean, it's, it's really questionable. Um, I would like to think that she was, I don't know, maybe she was put on the spot and those were the first few words that came out of her mouth and she hopefully did not mean it. Um, I wouldn't say that these kind of things happen in Singapore um, because of the dynamics. I mean, uh, I think with what had happened there, you know, she's talking about women who are, I mean, can we, can we call them immigrants? Yeah, yeah. Um, or came, came from, the, from families, yeah, immigrant yeah. families. Mm -hmm. They come from immigrant families, exactly. Yeah, so that, that doesn't happen so much here. Um, but let's not talk about Singapore, but just talking about the Southeast Asian region, for example, I do see a lot of this, um, trying to find the right words here, but white supremacy almost. Um, but, okay, so for example, if we talk about, okay, Bali, everyone knows Bali. Yeah. Um, the local population, they're thriving with, you know, all the natural resources that they have, but in comes Mr. You know, Mr. British wants to open a restaurant. And for him, it's, it's easy to do so because he has the know-how and just being, I, appropriation by a Westerner almost, almost comes off as a certificate um, of producing something that's just better. Mm. You know, you're using products, natural products, natural indigenous products, but because you are a Westerner that uses it, it immediately becomes like 10 times better when all these resources have, be have belonged to um, the locals for the longest time. But what do the locals do? They just have to serve and they don't have a voice. They can't really stand up for, for themselves. And I think this is a bit, um, it's unfortunate. I'm not saying that every, you know, um, every European or American that comes to Southeast Asia has the intention of doing that, but just because of how society is built, that ends up happening. Yeah, and I think also that even could be uh, potentially possible, even if you are a person of color who grew up abroad and comes back to Asia, there could be also a little layer of privilege there potentially. So I think there just needs to be an awareness of like, okay, if you, hold that space of privilege, how are you sharing that space with the people who deserve the credit um, and who deserve the acknowledgement? Absolutely. Um, and you know, I, I can say that I fall under that category. Uh, sitting here in Singapore, I come from a position of privilege. I mean, not like simply because I'm Chinese, first of all, we're the majority race, but also because I'm half white. Um, and it's, it's so important to be cognizant of that, I feel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I um, definitely am in so it's so interesting to think about how so many societies are uh, so different, but still there's still a thread that connects us all together. Um, and I love that what you do in your work is that you are actually, you know, I feel like your content really brings people together in the space of community and you're constantly sharing your knowledge and you're bringing value to people's lives. And um, I'm curious, you know, like because you work in media and you work in both traditional and digital media, um, do you consider, and, and because the media world has changed so much, first of all, the question is, do you consider yourself an influencer and uh, why or why not? Okay. Uh, I think if we open up the dictionary and use that definition of what influencer is, um, I would like to think that I am. But the term influencer has changed so much with, you know, the advent of social media that it almost has a negative connotation now. Um, I don't know about, you know, in France, but or over in the States, but here in Singapore, it, 
it's almost like the influencers almost look down upon because it's kind of like well the like your job is just to look pretty show off some skin hold a product and that's it you get paid you get paid thousands of dollars what is what is your messaging you know what are you bringing to the table so for me in the general sense of you know influencing people I would like to think that I I do do that through the work that I do simply because um, as a nutritionist I you know it's very important to me to educate people about food about health about the language that we use to talk about our bodies um, and as someone who cares about you know nature sustainability you know eco consciousness that's where I also try to influence people or rather impart knowledge such that I can influence them to you know think of taking on new habits for example so in that traditional definition uh, I would like to think that yes I I, I do uh, I, I rather I have I'm in a position to influence others right 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 and how would you you touched on it a little bit already but how would you define you know, influencer culture as it's now being defined by, you know, the greater public and or in the industry. Sorry, could you, could you repeat that? Yeah, I was just curious to know how you would define influencer culture as it's, you know, now um, defined by society, you know, locally in Singapore and also maybe in your industry. Yeah, well, I would like to think that, you know, being an influencer means that you truly have a message to share. And it's a message that would leave the world a better place than before you had started your account, Um, you know, and that you are really sharing knowledge and that you do bring something to the table. That's the most important part for me. Why why would a company want to work with you? Is it because you have a pretty face or because you have a message to share? Um, And I think people are slowly changing their mindset around that. Now, people can see through the filters. Um, They can tell when a message is genuine or not. It has even come to a point where I am concerned about working with a company and posting content, you know, that that requires me to tag a company because it almost seems as if it's no longer genuine. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think that's something that as content creators, we have to be really sensitive about as well. Yeah. And so how do you navigate that, right? Like, how do you, when you are working with brands, what is kind of your criteria for saying yes or no um, in that collaboration in order to continue staying grounded in your mission? Yeah, well, you know, I've not been in this industry for very long, um, but I would say about two, three years. And in the beginning, you know, when a brand first comes to you, you're like, oh my gosh, don't want to work with me? Yes, yes, yes. But over the past few years, um, I've realized that there actually is a, there are a lot of questions that you have to ask to make sure that you are aligned with the company, you are aligned with the messaging. Um, but sometimes it gets a bit tiring because, you know, this is, you don't want to say no to a potential paycheck. Right. But it's about remembering your, it's about ethics, right? About remembering why you're doing what you do. And unfortunately, I've had, I have had to turn down um, certain gigs because I don't know, perhaps, okay, so you asked me, what are the things I look out for? Sustainability is a huge thing for me. So for example, if it's a fashion brand, I ask about, you know, what material they use and where they source from, who's making their clothes. And it's really painful sometimes because you want to work with those big brands because it sounds glamorous. But at the end of the day, if you know that they're actually putting so many lives at risk and they are polluting the industries, I mean, to me, it doesn't make sense. And that's where you really have to make the call. And that's where I feel a true influencer stands out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of like, you know, some people, they don't like to hear that kind of talk because it's, oh, yeah, you're just telling us how you're doing good and how you said no to a job. But I think, I think it's important to share these messages and to share with people why you had to turn down a, a certain gig. And it's because you stand for the things that you say you stand for. Um, so these things are, yeah, like I, I, I think about sustainability, ethics, um, and when it comes to food, where they source their food from, you know, just like a couple of weeks ago, someone wanted to send me like a kilo of beef. They told me it was carbon neutral beef, but at the end of the day, it's still beef. And I'm not saying I don't eat beef, but why would I be sitting here promoting beef when I don't have to? If you had not come to me, I wouldn't be doing this. So, right. you know, I, I think it's important to think about these things and think about the influence that you're putting out there. 
Yeah, well, and I think for someone who does, who is rooted in ethics, how, um, you know, I'm sure that makes your job a little bit more challenging as well, right? Because you have to be a lot more um, discerning of all your partnerships. So what are the, you know, kind of, can you share a little bit about how you manage that and still maintain and continue having, um, you know, a successful platform? Yeah, it's challenging. And you are right, Ruby, the keyword is about being discerning. Um, it's about trust, trusting that the right partnership will come along, that the right companies will see you for what you stand for. I know it sounds super cliche. Um, it sounds very idealistic, but I have in the past few years learned that patience, um, well, you can reap benefits from being patient and from staying true to yourself. I think I would rather sit without any gigs for a while than to sit with having worked with someone and like deeply regret it. Right. And because doing the work that I do, a lot of people have their eyes on you. Yeah. Um, and it's not saying that because they have their eyes on me, I better behave, but it almost, you know, reminds me about what I stand for and about what these people are looking to me for. Um, yeah. So, but you know, at the end of the day, we are human, we do make mistakes. Um, so yeah, well, I yeah. like the idea of you saying that it is about patience because it is a long game. And I think sometimes if you create a, or you make a choice that only benefits um, you in the short term, then actually that could be really detrimental because then whatever you built for, like, you know, let's say you've been building your platform for X amount of years, one little slip up can actually destroy your entire reputation. So, you know, it is a long game and it's about making sure that whatever that you're doing now is going to feed into the, the greater mission that you have. And so going with that, I'd love for you to share and kind of articulate in your own words, like what is your mission? What grounds you in this world that sometimes leans on the superficial, right? Um, what, what helps you stay grounded in your positioning? Um, what helps me stay grounded? I think, I know, I know, I know it's, it, it is a huge privilege to say this, but it's because I really believe in what I do. I started doing what I do because it's so much a part of my life. Mm -hmm. um, the three pillars that I, you know, generally talk about would be food, health, and sustainability. Um, food and uh, food, easy one, okay? That one we can all relate to. Health is something that, you know, has always, always been important to me since young. And that is why I studied to become a nutritionist. I told myself, if, if I can't land a job, as a nutritionist, at least I know I can help my family. At least I know I can help myself. And I think that's valuable information because with the internet and, you know, media out there talking about crazy things like detox diets, you know, you get lost in, in the science. And I really wanted to know once and for all for myself, um, how, how, to, how to discern, you know, fact from fiction. So that's one. And then for sustainability, I mean, my dad had always raised me to be someone that was uh, conscious about the impact that I left behind um, and to be thoughtful about what I use about you know whenever we shop for something it was always do, do you really need this or is it because you want it um, so these things come very naturally to me and that's why they are the messages that I share um, so I'm very aligned with it and because it's innate it's easy to stay grounded almost in those in those messages but of course you know with social media you fall into traps like wondering you know should I really be talking about the the unpopular opinions you know am I should I actually fit into this mold that everyone is fitting into and why why, why don't I just make things easier for myself just show a little skin you know <laughs> but it's just not me <laughs> no and thirst I don't traps. feel natural <laughs> no thirst traps on Charlotte's page <laughs> you know you know and so some people ask me do you get like you know really weird people writing to you yeah I do but definitely not as many as like a lot of other girls out there and does that mean that I'm less popular sure that's fine but at least it's for the right reasons right. um so I mean I, I'm thankful that and and I really it's 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 thanks to my parents that I I think this way um I grew up pretty much an old soul and that's how people always described me and I think 
that also has a part to play. Um, but my parents have always rem reminded me about who I am and how important that is and not to care about what other people thought. I mean, it's easier said than done, of course. Yeah. I mean, I grew up looking so different from everyone um, here in Singapore. I had I had hairy arms, you know, um, I was freakishly tall and sure people can say that, oh, but these are actually nice qualities. But when you're young, it's not the same and it yeah. plays with your mind. Um, so we, we all have our, our own internal struggles. And sometimes I wonder, you know, do I even look uh, appealing to the audience here? Because I look neither here nor there. Mm. When I used to do acting gigs, they used to say, well, you don't look Asian enough, but you don't look white enough as well. So, wow. you know, yeah. um, those things happen. Yeah, well, and I mean, uh, kind of going more along the lines of internal struggles, um, of course, you've already mentioned a couple of them, but like in your line of work today, right, especially now with the added um, data that is available to us on a daily basis in terms of how many people are watching your stories or, um, you know, the followers that you have, which I, I think, of course, um, feed into um, any opportunities that you might have, right? I think sometimes what could be a little bit strange nowadays in this kind of environment is that it's not necessarily sometimes the talent that you have or the experience that you have that gets you in the door. It's sometimes people, you know, because it's the media world and there is a very kind of superficial element to that. Um, sometimes it's about the numbers that you have. So I'm just curious to know for you, like, are these things that you still struggle with and, um, and why or why not? Yeah. I would say yes and no. I struggle because it is the norm in the industry. But at the same time, I don't struggle on a personal level because I don't, I mean, obviously it took me some time to get here, but I remind myself that the numbers do not reflect um, the quality of my work or the quality of my content. Um, and I always remind myself that if I had touched one person's life, life that is good enough, you yeah. know? Um, and it doesn't matter if this person was famous or not, you know, it's, you have still affected change in some way. Um, I used to be really frustrated because my numbers were growing really, really slowly. And that's because I don't talk about very um, popular topics. It, it's, it's very niche. So one thing that, I mean, I took comfort in the fact that whoever followed me was a quality follower. Right. They're not following me for my skin <laughs> that I'm not showing. Um, and they're not following me because, you know, I, I share about like the, the latest handbag. They're following me because they really want to care about how they can care for themselves, care for their family or care for the earth. Um, so I guess that's what, I mean, the industry term for that is micro-influencer. Um, and I was totally fine with that but it did hurt of course when people said oh sorry you know we can't really pay you as much because you don't have that many numbers and it's frustrating because you know that some of the well most of the accounts out there with you know crazy numbers are bought followers especially in a place like Singapore if you live in Philippines where like fan culture is huge it makes oh sense God. to have like you know a million followers but no here we are a population of five million people right so and you know <laughs> yeah you have people with more followers than there are people in Singapore yeah exactly <laughs> and um and then you know you you can sniff them out when they've got like 143,000 followers but like you know 200 likes it doesn't add up but right. you can't tell this to your client um and of course your client is just it's, it's all numbers. They need to prove the numbers to their bosses, you know, for the budget and X, Y, Z. So um, that was frustrating, but uh, I, I did, hit, it's not so silly to say this, but it was a big win for me. I hit 10,000 followers, um, I think last month or two months ago. I know it sounds so silly to say this, but what I like about that is because I can now do swipe up links and that's what I, I always know. wanted to do because you can like have more time on your IGTV videos. It's great. You get like all these privileges. Yeah. So that's why the numbers are important to me because you get privileges with it. But, you know, it's 
like sometimes I get followers that I know are not in it for the messages that I want to share. And for me, those followers don't count anyway. So, right. Well, and now that you have reached your, you know, an, 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 an ideal number, and I'm sure you're going to keep growing and hitting more um, uh, different levels. Right. But like, I'm sure that that didn't come overnight. So can you describe kind of like how you started? Like, what did your first video look like? You know, like, because I think now when people maybe are stumbling across you, there's, they, 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 they maybe are thinking, oh, well, I'm sure it's always been like this. And it's easy to think that way, especially if you're starting off as a creator, or you're just, let's say someone just started their Instagram account. They want to be a content creator, but then there's all of these things that they have to compare themselves to. Um, and a lot of times they see their favorite influencers um, and they're already very polished and shiny, but they forget that, hey, it wasn't always like that. So I'd love for you to share like kind of what your beginning stages look like. Yeah, well, it was a hike, Ruby. It wasn't even just uphill, it was uphill, downhill, uphill, downhill. And I have to thank the beautiful souls around me that really helped me. It, you know, the belief in myself started with people around me they believed in me more than I even believed in myself and I have huge imposter syndrome um I I constantly doubt myself um mm -hmm. in fact one of my um exes in the past used to get mad at me because I was constantly doubting myself and he was he was like sick and tired of me doubting myself um but it happens and because you're in this alone and it's scary and one thing about you know, what I do, Ruby, is that when I started out, there was no one else that I knew of in Singapore who was doing what I did. Because like I said, it's so specific. No, all the nutritionists in Singapore were hiding in the hospitals. No one was out here on social media talking about food and health. It's so unsexy. And then when I started talking <laughs> about, let's save food, guys. Let's bring our own bag. Let's, you know, bring our own handkerchief. It's again, an incredibly unsexy topic. People are like, ew, you, you mean you eat with napkins? By the way, I know in France, that's very normal. So I would just like to stay on this platform. In France, people eat with napkins and they just wash it like normal people do with their underwear. But here, people just find it weird to eat with napkins. I'm not even kidding. They, they need their tissue paper that they then throw away. So anyway, um, I digress. But it was hard because there was no one to look up to. So I just had to find other women out there who were perhaps talking about other messages, but kind of um, share the same ethos as myself. Yeah. Uh, and every time I felt like I was spiraling or I didn't know what I was doing or whether or not I was good enough, I thought, what would these women do? Um, and I always reminded myself that I was doing this not Yes, I was doing this, you know, to, to educate people, but I was doing it more for myself um, because it came from me. So I constantly had to remind myself that I didn't have to prove myself to anyone. Um, and I think that was what helped me the most. Um, but also, it, again, it's people that were around me. When I, first my, when I first put my first show out, I will tell you the idea was in my head for two years, Ruby, and I, I didn't do it until someone asked me they said well what's the one thing that's stopping you and I and, and and I told him what it was and he said well let's just solve that and get it done so I put together a team of three people um and we started shooting in my kitchen and it was the most beautiful thing ever I didn't even care about the number of people that were watching it um so but you know I, I gotta admit it's really tiring sometimes to constantly put out content because you have to think it you have to plan it you have to produce it you have to action everything and it gets tiring I'm the kind of person, I'm a perfectionist. So until the idea is perfect in my head, I'm not going to execute it. And that's not a good thing. And that's what I know. Like you have to know your strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. So I know that I'm someone that needs a team yeah. to yeah. push me. Uh, mm -hmm. I have the ideas, but I need someone to like, you know, push me along. Right. So, and well, it's okay. I, I, I will say it's very surprising to hear that you doubt yourself because you have such excellent content and you do come off as someone so warm and so comfortable on camera and you just look like you're in your element. So it's very surprising, but of course not surprising at the same time, because I think that especially if you're working in media and you're putting stuff out there, you're naked essentially, right? Like you're very vulnerable and you're basically leaving like the baby, like little content babies that you've nurtured, that you've put your heart into out there for either, you know, reception or people to take it down. 
So it's also a very brave and courageous thing. And I'm glad that you're out there doing it. I'm glad that you're one of the people that is really bringing, you know, soul food to our internet buffet, right? I love my little metaphors. It's so silly, but you know, (laughs) in a world, right? Like I feel like in a way there's a lot of eye candy on the internet. Um, but it's really special when you get to see something that is more soulful and, um, more nourishing. So, but also you had, um, told me in our previous conversation that even when you did start making videos, um, it wasn't until a certain number of videos when you actually started to see things kind of pick up. Like, so how many videos did you make before you felt like, oh, there's some traction yeah, actually, thanks for reminding me about that. I completely forgot. So when I started the show, it was mainly because my I had one mission, which was to bring people back into the kitchen. In Singapore, 75% of the population eats out on a daily basis. And I saw that people were no longer building that relationship with food. It was very disconnected. They didn't know what was going to their bodies. You just go to a restaurant, pop, order your food, eat it, done. When you're cooking at home, you know what goes into your food. You're caring about it. And then like you can control what comes into your body and you won't find yourself 25 years down the road going oh how did I end up with you know diabetes or looking this way or feeling that way so I wanted to bring people back into the kitchen I know we have very busy lives here in Singapore we worked extremely hard Um, but just if if it's even one meal a week to cook something up even if it's an omelet I wanted to teach people that cooking is easy and that tasty food can be healthy and that healthy food can be tasty healthy food is like does not have to be synonymous with boring food and so that's why I started the channel and I just wanted to put content out didn't really care about you know what was going to come out of it but 15 videos after 15 uh so that's the magic number a client came on board and they said you know we really like what you do and could you help us market our our products and it was really funny because it was honest again not the sexiest brand I have to I have to say this and they and they know it themselves so even if they're watching you know I'm not saying that <laughs> they are they are um, a heritage brand in Singapore and they wanted some form of rebranding so that you know it's not just your grandma's eating it that the youngsters are eating it too and it's a very nutritious product and I grew up eating it so immediately I said yes like a hell yes that was a hell yes to me um and I know some people were like gosh why are you working with them it's such a weird brand but you know it was a household brand that we all grew up with and I think now it's becoming a bit more sexy awesome so yeah so the so the key I guess uh, in that lesson is that consistency does pay off right because 15 videos that's a pretty long process and like just out of curiosity how many months, you know, you know, did that kind of 15 video process take place? Three months. Um, that, yeah, that took place over three months of filming and editing. Um, but you're completely right in saying consistency because I think, and consistency and patience, because when you put something out there, you kind of expect everyone that's going to watch it to watch it at that moment. You have to give it time. I mean, until now, I still get comments on my videos uh, on YouTube that were put up months ago. Um, so it's nice to know that, that people are slowly finding things out. And it's consistency because consistency and patience, because once you put out five videos, for example, you can't think, oh no, this is not getting traction. Ooh, maybe I'll take a turn and do something different. No, you have to remember why you did it and to stay true to your message. And it's okay if like, you know, you're not getting a thousand viewers. Again, even if it's five viewers, five people saw this, five more people saw this than if you didn't put it out there. I know it sounds crazy, but these were like, the, the, like this was the dialogue I had to have with myself. Absolutely. Um, and to be okay with small numbers. Yeah, well, and then also, because you are a perfectionist, I'm curious to know about like, you know, does everything have to be perfect all the time? You know, when people are putting things out, I think one thing that stops them is like, oh, that's not good enough. Or that there's something off about this. So never mind. I mean, that I struggled with that for a long time. You know, I wanted to create video content for so long, but I didn't know how to edit videos. I didn't know how to like make things look pretty. So I just didn't do it for the longest time, even though this was actually my dream project. And then somehow in the climate, current climate that we're living in, it's somehow now okay to do live streaming. And I've kind of found like a, a way to do what I've always wanted to do, but it is raw and it is imperfect. 
Um, but for you, like, what are your thoughts around, you know, creating content that may not necessarily be 100%, you know, wrapped up in a pretty bow? It's funny because for me, it's not so much wrapped up in a pretty bow. It's not so much perfection in terms of how it looks, but mm -hmm. it's, I'm, I'm still trying to define what this perfection means. Is it perfection based on how people see me or how I see myself? Because in certain circumstances, I am okay with imperfection. And I always tell people around me, imperfection is okay. And people love raw. But I guess, I don't know. Honestly, Ruby, I'm still trying to figure this one out. Because I get frustrated at myself whenever I feel an idea is not good enough. And so I shelve it. But I don't think I've really sat with myself to ask myself, what about it is imperfect? Mm. And if it's a good message, why don't you just put it out? You know, why care about how people will receive it yeah. but I guess because I so believe in my message and I want it and I just want it to be received well um and that I wouldn't take anything lesser than that um and so I just want to push myself yeah yeah but I like what you said about figuring out what your metrics are for defining perfect right? Is it yeah. aesthetic? Is it the quality of the mission? Is it the quality of how the message was delivered? I think that's also really valuable. But it's also interesting to get your take on the process and how much you think about, you know, like, I think sometimes people think like, oh, you know, an Instagram post will only take you like five minutes to do, but give me some background. For some people, it does. <laughs> Tell me more about that. <laughs> I know, Ruby, I am an overthinker. I know that there are some people out there, like they are born content creators. They just think up an idea, boom, do it. It's, it's done, it's out. Um, and I'm honestly, this year, my mantra this year, I don't know if I told you this when we met up in France, but my mantra this year was just do it. Don't mm -hmm. think, just do. Uh, I waste a lot of time thinking uh, and you spiral, you hate your idea even more. You just got to do it. So it's funny, I, I have had moments uh, this year where I really just went ahead to do something without thinking. And it feels so liberating. It's not natural to me. And I think for anyone who also feels this way has to know that it's normal. We all have very different personalities. I used to grow up being jealous of the creative kids out there. Um, but you got to understand that you actually have strengths that, that they don't. And it's okay, you know, and these are the people that actually need to work together. So, um, what was I talking about again? Well, no, I was talking, <laughs> we, were talking, we were talking about how, what actually goes into the process of posting one yes. post. Okay, I put a lot of thought into it because I go back to what I said previously. I don't want to come off as just a mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just pay lip service to something. So for example, uh, a few weeks ago, I got sent um, an outfit from this company. Uh, they're called Tove and Libra. They're based in Hong Kong, but they're all about sustainable fashion. Uh, they sent me, you know, a, a set of clothing. They're like, oh, it would be so great if you could post this on your Instagram. I'm not one to just, oh, I received this. I'm going to take a picture and post about it. Uh, and then the caption's going to be like, tell me what you're doing this Sunday. That is not me. Like, I can't. That is so easy, but I can't do that. So I think so hard about the message I want to share, how it's going to come across. Is it going to come across as an ad? I want to put my personal touch into it. So I'm sitting there, I'm drafting my caption like I'm writing an essay or something. Right. Um, so, uh, are so know, yeah, some people can say that I'm overthinking it, but this it's important to me, you know? Um, so a lot of work goes behind it. And then thinking about taking the picture because now, I mean, my I'm only in my house or out in my little garden outside. Um, so I ended up taking the picture in the corridor outside my neighbor's house. I even, I, I remember him coming out saying, do you need help? And I was like, oh no, sorry. Can I just take a picture in the corridor? Um, but yeah, and, and I'm not one to just, naturally struck a pose in front of the camera uh, and think that I look great. I, so much thought goes into it. So it, it's, uh, it, it's a very time consuming process, I have to say, yeah. yeah. Well, for any person who is just starting to create content right now, what would your you know, advice be for them? My advice would be to figure out your why because you're gonna constantly come back to it. And in your lowest moments, 
in your highest moments, you have to remember why you're doing what you do and talk about grounding. I mean, that's what's going to ground you um, because no matter what people say, as long as you believe in why you're doing something, um, no, one, no one can take that away from you.